Okay, good morning and thank you for joining us uh, for this latest Middle East Institute virtual event uh, and the first to be hosted by MEI's newly launched Syria program. I'm Charles Lister, the director of MEI Syria and Countering Terrorism and Extremism programs and I'm delighted to bring you an esteemed panel today who I'll introduce shortly to discuss a timely and consequential issue. The recent activation of the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act and the wide ranging implications of what is the most aggressive sanctions based legislation yet to be enforced on Syria's regime. After several years of effort in Congress and across the US government, the Caesar Act was passed into force late in 2019 and came into action on June 17th last week. The act focuses on preventing governments, individuals and entities from financially engaging with Syria's Assad regime in order to prevent any further repression of Syria's civilian population and the lengthening of an already long list of war crimes committed by the regime. The legislation takes the name of a Syrian man known by the code name Caesar, a former military photographer who defected in 2013 and smuggled out over 50,000 photographs nearly 30,000 of which showed thousands of deceased prisoners visibly and brutally tortured to death and, and displayed outside prison facilities with numbers written or stamped on their emaciated corpses. As, Syria's, as Caesar's work gained attention in Syria in recent days, countless Syrians have noticed relatives amongst the grisly photos, bringing to light once again the devastating consequences of the Syrian regime's strategy of enforced disappearance. More than 100,000 people continue to be considered disappeared in Syria, assumed kidnapped by Syria's notoriously brutal security services. The sanctions announced last week came into force, it came into force amidst an unprecedented economic crisis in Syria, with hyperinflation bringing the Syrian pound to roughly 3,000 to a single US dollar. Small businesses are closing, imports are plummeting, and those living under the poverty line, already at 85%, are increasing in number. An average monthly salary in, now, in Syria now reportedly buys a large bag of lemons. Rife corruption and government incompetence has triggered a wheat crisis, and some humanitarians are warning of a potential famine this winter. While Lebanon remains mired by economic crisis and COVID continues to spread in Syria, Turkey's decision to accelerate the rollout of the Turkish lira to nearly a third of Syria's in-country population in the northwest could well be the nail in the coffin for what remains of the Syrian regime's economy. In an MEI podcast released last week, our non-resident scholar Danny Mackey, who focuses on the internal dynamics of regime-held Syria, posited that the current crises inside Syria might represent a more dangerous threat to Assad than any military threat seen in recent years. And yet, as its citizens face increasingly dire conditions, the regime has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in recent weeks on new fighter jets from Russia and armored vehicles, and it's purposefully burnt wide swathes of agricultural land in the northwest of the country. Fueled by these economic and now political frustrations, Syria's minority Druze community have taken to the streets in recent weeks, holding bold anti-regime protests and expressing unusual vocal solidarity with the opposition zone in Idlib. Protests have also been seen in Syria's southern Dera governorate, where an expanding insurgency is developing. In the regime-controlled central desert, ISIS is slowly resurging, and in loyalist communities, public expressions of discontent and criticism for the regime are emerging more clearly than at any point since 2011. So might these sanctions, teamed up with diplomacy, force the Syrian regime or its Russian and Iranian backers into compromise? Or will they only serve to exacerbate rising human suffering across the country? These and many more questions will be up for discussion to today. And to take part in this discussion, I'm really thrilled to introduce our panelists. First, we have Ambassador James Jeffrey, who's currently the US Special Representative for Syria Engagement and the US Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Ambassador Jeffrey also formally has held senior positions across the US government, including as Deputy National Security Advisor and as Ambassador in Iraq and Turkey. Next, we have Reem Alaf, a Syrian-born writer and political analyst who holds a seat on the boards of the Day After Project and the Syrian Economic Forum, and was an Associate Fellow at Chatham House from 2004 to 2012. And we finally have Kutayba Idlibi, a non-resident fellow with MEI's Syria program, 
As a former detainee and torture victim himself, Koteba is in a unique position to talk on this panel. And he's also a Syria fellow at the International Center for Transitional Justice, where his work focuses on political imprisonment in Syria. Ambassador Jeffrey, Reem and Koteba, welcome. Finally, a few last remarks. In terms of the format for today, each panelist will begin with roughly five minutes of opening remarks, followed by a moderated discussion. This event is live on Zoom, on MEI's live stream, and live on C-SPAN. To the many people worldwide currently dialed into this event on Zoom, I'd encourage you all to submit questions using the Q&A feature, which you should see on your screens. For those dialing in by phone, watching on our live stream, or on C-SPAN, you can submit questions to us by emailing them to events at mei.edu. Feel free to submit questions at any point during the event. I'll do my very best to work them into the discussion. Uh, and one final note, uh, we're under, I understand we're currently scheduled um, to hold this event for an hour. Um, if the quantity of questions is as many as we expect, we may push a little bit beyond that time, um, but we'll play things by ear. Um, but to, uh, to kick off the discussion, Ambassador Jeffrey, again, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us um, and, uh, and please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Charles. Thank you for doing this. It's good to be back at an MEI event. Uh, we uh, did a lot to have worked together, including on Syria back in times past when I had another existence. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the uh, Secretary of State's and Secretary of uh, Treasury's uh, statements on the Caesar Act last week and some of the uh, commentaries and fact sheets. So I won't get into the details. What I want to do is to explain uh, why the Caesar Act is important, how we are going to implement it, and what the next steps are. Uh, most importantly, uh, start with the title, as Charles said, it's the uh, Civilian Protection Act of 2019. It is designed to protect the Syrian people from Assad in two ways, directly in the introduction by calling on the end to strikes against the Syrian people, and then more generally, uh, to require participation in the political process under the UN, that's the 22, resolution 2254 process, uh, for a political compromise solution, which is the American policy, and we do not deviate an iota from that. It is not regime change. It is not a separate deal with anybody. It is the UN process that we are supporting every way we can, including with this legislation. <clears throat> it's not the first. Uh, uh, sanctions um, action against uh, Syria. We've had a set of them, uh, mainly executive orders. But this is important, first of all, because it is a law. It is a law that was not only passed by Congress and signed by President Trump, it's a law that passed overwhelmingly, almost unanimously in both houses. That's very important because it reflects that Syria policy in the United States today covers all parts of the U.S. political system from the right to the left, from Republicans to Democrats, from people uh, who think very differently on other things. There is near unanimity on the need to do more on Syria because this is such a terrible conflict for its uh, own population. Uh, the latest statistics I've seen are that only a little over than a third of the population is now uh, under Assad's active control. Uh, a little less than a third are refugees in uh, Turkey Lebanon and Jordan, who've done an amazing job taking care of those people and some in Europe. And then almost a third are also in areas outside of regime control in the Northwest and the Northeast. Uh, so uh, that is a telling point on where Assad is today. Uh, we secondly see uh, this legislation as giving us uh, more powerful tools to go after those uh, cronies and oligarchs who are supporting Assad and Assad and his family uh, themselves, as you see from uh, the first list of uh, uh, sanctions we've rolled out, although those were under the executive order. But we're going to target these people with the Caesar Act or with anything else we can as part of a package. Uh, our goal is not to torpedo the economy. Believe me, Assad is more than capable of doing that himself, as Charles Lister just explained. Uh, he is doing a terrific job of pushing the pound into <clears throat> irrelevance and uh, undercutting whatever is left of the Syrian GDP. Uh, <clears throat> rather, it is to inflict real pain on those people around Assad and get them to understand this pain doesn't go away <clears throat> until they change their policies. <clears throat> that involves either breaking off support for the regime or a list of seven 
things that the regime has to do for the regime as a whole no longer to be sanctioned. That involves no longer <clears throat> besieging the Syrian people, no longer carpet bombing them, uh, dealing with war criminals, uh, encouraging refugees to return, and on and on. Uh, another thing that we expect from the Syrian government is to stop threatening the neighborhood, be it by allowing or ignoring the terrorist threat that has grown up in that country. Uh, Charles again mentioned uh, uh, ISIS is on the march again in those areas that we don't control, uh, be it use of chemical weapons, be it the weaponization of refugees, be it inviting in Iran with its hegemonic regional agenda or inviting in Russia with a different but equally troubling agenda. <clears throat> the Syrian conflict has sucked in five outside armies, including the US, uh, the Turkish, and uh, a third uh, country neighbor that I won't mention because it usually wants to uh, keep its participation that is significant uh, quiet. Uh, but uh, we have to resolve all of these uh, geostrategic issues as well as the uh, humanitarian issues before we can move forward. Next, the CESA Act has very strong humanitarian provisions that require us in the US government to explain to Congress and ensure in our actual sanctions targeting that we do not undercut the humanitarian efforts underway. The United States uh, will be pledging a significant amount at the EU pledging conference for humanitarian aid at the end of this month already with over $10.6 billion, we're the biggest humanitarian contributor. That will not stop, nor should it, in this time of COVID-19. <clears throat> but we will continue these sanctions because of their nature. Uh, they allow us to do sec secondary sanctions. They target specific areas. Uh, in one sense, uh, money laundering, the central bank, which is important, although it's already been sanctioned in other areas, but also uh, the aviation industry, particularly military aviation, energy industry, construction industry. We want to make it clear to anybody who wants to rebuild Assad's Syria that that cannot happen without uh, Caesar sanctions uh, until we have a political process. Uh, now, what are we going to do with all of this? Uh, in looking at the larger picture right now, and Charles mentioned much of this, first of all, we see an economic freefall of the Assad regime, largely through his own behavior and the collapse of the uh, banking system in Lebanon. Secondly, we see his military offensive uh, has still made it. Uh, in Idlib, he was stopped in his tracks by a powerful Turkish and opposition counteroffensive. Uh, the US has not left the Northeast, nor Al-Tam. Uh, the president in his own way, uh, in talking about withdrawals, for example, from Afghanistan, uh, made clear that while he eventually will withdraw from Syria, uh, nothing is on the uh, table right now. Uh, and the third country I mentioned, uh, is in many respects being ever more effective, particularly at targeting Iranian and uh, threatening Syrian targets. So the military situation isn't that great. Uh, finally, on the accountability front, which is so important in this conflict, we're seeing a great deal of support from uh, uh, Secretary General Guterres, who spoke out in written form in his reply to the uh, uh, outrageous and shameful 2504 resolution that cut two of the four uh, humanitarian corridors into Syria, calling for those corridors, or at least the one in the Northeast, to be reinstated, and pointing out the obvious that the Syrian government is doing nothing uh, significant to allow humanitarian deliveries in areas it does not control. We have seen uh, the Board of Inquiry called by the Secretary General uh, condemning the regime and indirectly the Russians for exploiting the passing of information, grid coordinates and others on safe areas uh, that were then subsequently uh, bombed. We've seen the OPCW with its IIT uh, condemnation of the regime for three attacks in the spring of 2017 with chemical weapons, blaming not only regime forces, but saying that this had to have been agreed to and audited by the top levels of the government. So that's the fourth thing, along with the military situation, uh, the economy, our sanctions and accountability that we believe will allow us to press the Russians, our interlocutor, for a negotiated uh, settlement under 2254. Thank you, Charles. Ambassador, thank you very much for, for those opening remarks. Um, I think uh, we'll go to Kateba next. Thank you so much for being with us, Kateba. Of course, thank you so much, Charles, and you know, thanks for organizing this um, and for Ambassador Jeffrey's efforts in the State Department. 
um, to really, you know, establish this communication with the Syrian people, explain what the Caesar Act is and, you know, what the steps uh, forward are. Um, I, as you said, this is a really important step um, towards accountability, especially for an issue like forced disappearance in Syria. A lot of people looked at um, forced disappearance as kind of like a side effect of the conflict in Syria. But in reality, this has been going on for as long as, you know, the Ba'ath Party was established in Syria, or as long as 1963 when the first when they came into power. Um, we, you look at, we, I look specifically at the design of the Syrian laws and how basically the Syrian regime has designed the Syrian laws specifically to funnel all of those detainees through a legal system that would put them in prison for years. So this is not just, you know, a side issue, side unorganized issue. I think it's great that, you know, we're putting this step forward um, towards, you know, bringing a lot of uh, the committers of war crimes and crimes against humanity, um, torture and killing of detainees, um, and maybe hopefully bring some hope to the families of tens of thousands of disappeared in Syria. Um, of course, what is coming ahead of us, I think um, there are two challenges. Um, the first one is to control the narrative reg regarding the, Syrian, uh, this, uh, the Caesar Act. Um, again, I respect Ambassador Jeffrey's efforts in the last week in reaching out to different Syrian communities to talk about the Caesar Act and address the concerns Syrians have. I've I almost seen, you know, seen him every day last week talking to different Syrian communities and addressing their questions. Because the Syrian regime will continue to bank on the sanctions to justify its economic failure, it's important to continue these efforts and um, to listen and to hear, to control the narrative that is reaching the Syrian people. That would be by continuing to reach out to the Syrian people, but also by listening to the Syrians and see how the side effects of the Caesar Act will affect the lives of ordinary Syrians and try basically to mitigate those effects, but whether through exemptions, whether through change, you know, change through the sanctions list, this is really important to tell the Syrian people that the Caesar Act is targeting those who are committing crimes specifically against detainees and not, you know, and not targeting the lives of ordinary Syrians. The second challenge is to adapt, to make sure actually that the Caesar Act and the sanctions resulting from the Caesar Act are actually serving their goal is to, to make sure that we have a very responsive sanction program. Um, if we look at the sanction program today, out of three, almost over 300 individuals, uh, Syrian individuals listed on the sanctions list, we have 270 individuals, for example, from the research center a uh, research scientific cent uh, center working on chemical weapons. If we want to make sure that actually the Caesar Act are in effect and we are targeting people who are, you know, behind detaining Syrians, behind torturing Syrians, we need to really expand and look into those individuals in every intelligence center, in every um, government secure, uh, yeah, secret prison to make sure that we actually have those individuals on the list, those who are directly responsible for those horrific acts we've seen in the Caesar Act. Thank you, Charles. Taylor, thank you so much for, for placing that into some very important context. Um, Reem, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please go ahead. Thank you for having me. And I think I have a very good point uh, on which to start, which is to follow up with what Kutaiba was saying. The narrative on the sanctions is extremely important for Syrians to understand why this is necessary and how it could possibly benefit them, but also to counter the other narratives, which is that everything that the regime has done has been to save the country, has been to save Syrians, and none of this would have happened had it not been for those sanctions and for this uh, fantasy of regime change conspiracy from the world. And I think it's very important to remind those people whether they are knee-jerk reactions, as usual from people who say that anything the US does must be bad, or they are pure ignorance about what the regime has done. We imagine that the economy and the situation of most people is in dire straits because of the war. But I ask you to go back nine years and to look at the situation in 2010, 2011, when Bashar Assad had been in power for 10 years already. It is true that it was a revolution for dignity, but dignity is not only about human rights and political rights. It also is about the dignified living in, um, in everyday life and everything that concerns you. And um, the economy was in free fall. If you had followed Syria, you would have known already that everything that was done by this regime from turning 
a socialist closed economy into a so-called open economy, but only for a certain um, segment of society. So while they launched into this crony capitalism, no concurrent measures were taken to make sure that the normal economy for everybody else was going on. So that means that people saw subsidies begin to be reduced without something to make up for them. And the subsidies were needed because under the father, uh, Hafiz Asad for 30 years, everything was closed. And the only way that people could access anything from uh, gas to, um, to bread needed to be subsidized. So I think we need to really look at these issues to understand that even if the sanctions were removed from one day to the next, we would not be getting the normal um, involvement of a government, of a normal government with the people. I want to also mention that if anybody has been fleecing the Syrian people, it has been the regime for all these years. In the news lately has been the, um, the price or the fee of $800 for any Syrian to renew his or her passport. This is not new. The regime has also made, always made Syrians pay for the privilege of going to Syria. Just by way of example, I can tell you that even young men who had never lived in Syria, but who come from Syrian heritage and wanted to visit their country would have to pay five, 10 or $15,000 to be exempt from the military. This has gone for years. The import fees on cars until very recently, until 2005, um, the import tax, the duty was 255%. And we can name numerous um, examples of how it has always been the Syrians who had to pay this heavy price to be able to participate in daily life. So this is an answer to the, you know, to the naysayers who say that the sanctions hurt the people. I'm not going to pretend they cannot hurt the people. They can hurt the people. And that is why my position when I look at the situation today is to say that the sanctions alone are not enough. And Ambassador Jeffrey mentioned that there would be political pressure to move on with 2254. And I think this is the key, um, the key point that we have to keep on making that we have these sanctions only against the regime enablers, but at the same time, there is only one way out of this. And the way, if we don't call it regime change, we can at least call it political transition which is precisely what 2254 is about. And finally, I would say about the sieges that um, the regime has carried out repeatedly, uh, not just in Syrian cities, but I remind you that when the regime had to uh, withdraw very quickly after the assassination of Rafiq Hariri in 2005, it imposed a blockade on Lebanon. It left Lebanese trucks for weeks on end with their produce uh, rotting in the sun. This is not a new tactic by the regime. And it is um, um, really um, absurd to imagine that all these ills that have befallen the Syrian people are because of these sanctions. Reem, thank you uh, so much for those for those really important opening comments as well. I think uh, all three of you have have said things that that complement each other, but give uh, give very important different perspectives or overlapping perspectives. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, I, I think I'll come to you first. I mean, quite clearly, it's no secret to you that the that the legislation has sparked quite a debate um, within the community that's following Syria and, and events elsewhere in the Middle East. Um, uh, with with sort of part of the debate accusing these sanctions of of having overly ne an overly negative effect on the on the civilian population, and I think we've all or all three of you have addressed uh, why that argument by itself is potentially problematic. But I wanted to ask you about the fact that you know sanctions of any kind can have unintended consequences, and is there or are there any plans or actions um, underway by the U.S. government to try and uh, prevent or ameliorate any of those unintended consequences. There's been talk in northeastern Syria um, in recent weeks about whether the U.S. should be helping to bail out the SDF's economy. Uh, the SDF have increased salaries by 150 percent last week to make up for the inflation um, being seen in Damascus. So that's you know one example. Another thing that struck my mind is Asma al-Assad being included in the sanctions. Her Syria Trust for Development is engaged in 
some form of humanitarian work uh, in regime held areas, but it's dependent at least 90% on UN uh, financial assistance. Will uh, Syria Trust essentially cease to exist? Um, what some of those unintended consequences and, and, a, and a perspective from the US government um, would be very helpful. Uh, first of all, Charles, the uh, legislation has very strong language and very strong requirements on humanitarian assistance. <clears throat> we will adhere fully to them. <clears throat> we have no intention of targeting anything that delivers humanitarian assistance anywhere in Syria, including regime areas. Uh, uh, the first thing we're doing aside from uh, articulating that policy is ensuring that we can make an additional large contribution to the humanitarian uh, needs of Syria beyond the 10.6 billion we've already given. And some of that aid, including American aid, flows to regime areas. I want to repeat that. It's not just that we don't that we do nothing to stop humanitarian assistance going to regime areas. We actually provide aid to regime areas because we differentiate between aid to individuals and stabilization and reconstruction funding that will be exploited by the regime to build their uh, happy holiday <clears throat> uh, luxury resorts uh, for the oligarchs. Uh, on land taken from people that have been killed or driven away or put in prison. Uh, that's what we're opposed to, not humanitarian assistance. Uh, next, uh, these sanctions were just announced three days ago. The uh, incredible collapse of the Syrian pound and the other economic problems that Syria faces today cannot be blamed upon the sanctions. Uh, thirdly, we are looking at ways that we can enhance our stabilization assistance, for example, in the Northeast. Uh, there are $50 million, actually $54 million has recently uh, been notified to Congress on assistance to areas there, targeted on minorities and religious groups, but basically uh, it will help the entire situation. And we're looking at various other options uh, that have not yet gone um, uh, public. Finally, <clears throat> uh, humanitarian and if you will, low level stabilization activities that could help uh, the people uh, without unduly enriching and empowering this regime even more are among the first things that we would consider were we to see uh, Assad and his allies, the Russians and the Iranians, actually embrace 2254, embrace a permanent ceasefire, embrace a real role for the Constitutional uh, Committee, cooperate with us on going after the real terrorists rather than claiming the population of terrorists and attacking them, and releasing detainees in large numbers. The Russians, the Iranians, and the Syrians know our agenda. They know what we're willing to do. It's up to them to take a step in that direction. Thank you. Ambassador Jeffrey, thank you. I'll just follow up with another question, which actually seems to have been asked by a number of people who are tuning, tuning into the event today, um, or some, some version of this question, which is, the US policy has obviously shifted in recent years to call for a behavioral change in the regime rather than essentially regime change. Mm -hmm. um, but the language in, in the Caesar Act is fairly tough, or at least it's being perceived as fairly tough. And the question generally that's being asked is, is the regime able to meet the various requirements or demands and still survive? Um, or from a, you, from a regime perspective, do the demands essentially still add up to regime change? And what kind of implications might that have on the feasibility of, uh, of the ask? Well, first of all, I know the regime, uh, uh, rather the CESA Act, justifiably, understandably, and commendably uh, at various points attacks the horrific totalitarian rule of the biggest butcher in the world today, President Assad. But nonetheless, Charles, those seven criteria that it lists uh, as getting the regime out from under the Caesar Act uh, criteria uh, do not include uh, the demise of Assad. They, uh, taken together, along with our other policies, mean, and we just heard this from Reem, a dramatic shift in the behavior of this regime, uh, as we have seen seldom in the world, Although one example would be Japan under the same top leadership before and after World War II. Uh, that's the kind of reforms we're gonna see, uh, or we need to see uh, whether that can happen under this leader and the people around him. We don't know. It's a standard. It is consistent, and this is important with 2254 in the Security Council that passed it. The Security Council is not in the business of regime change, or at least not anymore for good reason, given uh, what has happened to some uh, uh, campaigns that have uh, 
been focused on that. Rather, we're focusing on a change of behavior. It's up to the Syrians themselves, the Syrian people through the Constitutional uh, Committee and through free elections. It's up to the Syrian leadership to decide whether they want to do that with the people running the country now or whether they have to go. It's not up to the United States. We just define and we have full international agreement in this even uh, by the Russians, at least uh, verbally and uh, officially uh, for those behaviors. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Reem and Kotebe, I have a couple of questions to ask both of you uh, uh, together, um, uh, and, and they're somewhat interlinked. I mean, the first one is as Syrians, um, it seems that Caesar and the Caesar Act was uh, relatively unknown in a lot of Syria until just the last week or two. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of sort of educating oneself in Syria about what it means and, and where it's going and what it's demanding. I just wonder what your take is on how the Caesar Act has been perceived inside Syria. Um, I mean, amidst different circles, I certainly have seen lots of different opinions as to whether it's a good or a bad thing, both in regime and opposition areas. And, and also um, as an extension of that, um, sort of having come from Syria, how does the regime, how do you think the regime will see this? Does the regime take this seriously uh, or will it continue to look at this in the very hard faced way that it has to military threats um, over the last nine years. How do you think the regime responds uh, to a challenge like this? Sorry, and uh, we, why don't we go Koteba first? Uh, we'll just go in the same order that we, uh, that we, that we started the panel. Sure thing. Um, so first uh, on the first issue, how people are preserving it. I mean, to be honest, I mean, there are kind of like mixed responses depending on, on where people are currently. Um, but to talk about the vast majority of under control, a lot of people are are afraid of the Caesar Act, because as you said, for so many years, I mean, the, the work on the Caesar Act has been going on for long, but Syrians have never heard of it. Even Syrians were actually outside government control. They like they heard of Caesar, but they haven't really known what what Caesar did. Like one of the things we've actually seen recently is a lot of families have discovered the Caesar photos recently. They have been looking at the Caesar photos and finding their relatives today, even though the photos have been, at least 6,000 of the photos have been released um, until like um, the beginning of this year. So it's kind of like there's this process of discovery and at the same time process of fear, because as I said, the, the Syrian government, the Syrian regime is controlling the narrative on what the Caesar Act is. It's banking on it basically to say all of this economic failure because of the war on Syrians in the past nine, 10 years, it's all because of the Caesar Act. And also another thing, this is a challenge for the regime itself. It's banking actually on the Caesar Act to, to justify its, its failure because of its commitments to Russia and Iran. In the past year or so, there has been a, you know, a big shortage of medicine and pharmaceuticals in the Syrian market. Um, a lot of it, the Syrian government has been using the narrative, this is a result of the Caesar Act, this has been because of the American sanctions. But in reality, the Syrian regime signed many contracts actually with Iranian companies, first to give them access to contracts with public hospitals and the one with the Ministry of Health. And at the same time, it actually prevented Syrian pharmaceutical factories who have been rehabilitated from actually continuing to work. So it's kind of pushing Syrian businesses out of this market because Iran wants the control of, you know, as of like so many things in Syria, wants to control over uh, the pharmaceutical um, uh, business in Syria. So this is, this is actually really important. Again, like we go back to the narrative, this has been kind of like the narrative that the regime is pushing. Um, on the other hand, it's also related to accountability and how Syrians are preserving. Um, I think it was really important that the Caesar Act included, um, you know, clause that will push for, uh, to, push, to fund and support the efforts of accountability in Syria. This should actually include specific efforts that actually um, put organized lists of, you know, people who, are, who were forcibly disappeared in Syria, whether by the Syrian government or by any other parties, and to help actually Syrian families figure out, you know, the fate of their relatives. If today, if we were talking today that Syrian families have not been able to see the Caesar photos for the past four years or have, do not have knowledge of the Caesar photos for the past four years, then we actually have a problem when it comes to accountability. And we need to address this problem. We need to fund and support those organizations. We're actually on the front line supporting those efforts. Um, to you, Reem. 
I uh, agree with you, Kutaiba, and I would add that precisely this is why all these exercises by different civil society organizations, such as the one I'm on the day after, why they are working so hard to continue uh, informing Syrians and uh, telling them what potential rights they would have in a transition to democracy. Uh, how Syrians see it is very important. They are, those who are under regime control are of course still able to see uh, international media, but it is very easy to believe that everything bad that is happening to them is because the world just won't leave them alone. And it's difficult for them to find proof to the contrary. So when the regime says, there's nothing we can do. They are against us. They are stopping everything. And look at what they're doing to Lebanon as well, because the Lebanese are as worried uh, as most Syrians are. Uh, it is because they don't have another outlet. So the narrative is important. Um, you know, um, talks such as the ones Ambassador Jeffrey is giving are extremely important, and they need to be translated by Syrians to Syrians. So there's a there's a parallel thing. There's fear, but there's also ignorance because they, even if they were to go and download the Caesar Act, it is difficult to understand the details. How the regime sees it is very different. The regime is a spiteful regime. When it is bitten from one side, it will try to sting you from another. And that is the way it has always acted. So we assume that, you know, those of us who know the regime and have been studying this regime for years, we know that the first reaction is always one of in increasing the suffering on the people to show their people that this is what will happen to you, not because of us, but because of the Americans, because of the EU, etc. So I do not believe that for the time being, they are as scared as we want them to be, nor that they are ready to change some of their behavior. And you have to remember that some of those um, acts, actions that they are required to take cost them nothing. Like the release of 130,000 detainees is not something that is going to shape the regime. So they are uh, banking on the fact that a desperate people who are looking ahead to the winter and being afraid that while they can eat watermelon and a few fruit right now will not be able to heat their homes or to have enough to feed their children in the coming months. This is what the regime is banking on. The regime is hoping that its population, its loyalists, and even those against the regime will be so um, anxious for the sanctions to end that they would not turn their attention to something else, which is why sanctions alone are not enough. We need education and we need pressure to continue with 2254. Reem Kateba, thank you so much um, for those really uh, important answers. Um, I have a few things to follow up with you, but I think I'll, I'll quickly go back to Ambassador Jeffrey first. Um, Ambassador, uh, uh, two, two interlinked questions, uh, again, coming primarily from the audience. Um, one is uh, one that you've most likely been asked already uh, in, in other formats. Uh, is the US prepared to potentially sanction allies uh, in the region or in Europe or elsewhere who decide to still re-engage um, financially or engage financially with the regime? Um, and secondly, um, there was some expectation that some Caesar sanctions would target Russia. Uh, Russia seemingly has got away by and large um, uh, from US sanctions so far since intervening in, in 2015. Um, is there, uh, I'm, whether you're in a position to say so or not, um, but would there be a plan to uh, target uh, the Russian defense industry, for example, um, through the Caesar Act? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the U.S. government does not comment on anticipated or potential or under consideration sanctions because they have not been approved by the entire chain of command. And that chain of command in the case of uh, uh, these sort of sanctions goes uh, to the very top. Uh, so uh, I can't give you any specifics. What I can tell you is the ground rules. Uh, there are two things to remember in the CESA Act. First of all, like essentially not all, but most sanctions, uh, they establish the parameters within which an administration can act. Anything that falls within these parameters is sanctionable. Uh, emphasis there is on the last two syllables of both, which is conditional. That is, you can. 
Uh, it then lists uh, in one or another form, the Caesar Act does it quite uh, explicitly, as I said earlier, but other um, sanctions and related uh, legislation and executive orders do it in another, one or another way. The diplomatic purpose, the rationale for doing these things. So uh, for an entity to be sanctioned, be it a Syrian entity or somebody else's entity, uh, a government, an individual, or a institution, a firm, it has to meet the criteria of CISA, which is quite explicit, and sanctioning that entity has to serve a foreign policy goal of uh, stopping attacks on civilians and pushing the regime towards uh, the political process, pushing the regime towards meeting the criteria that are laid out in those seven uh, subparagraphs in the legislation, and that's what we'll do. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, Reem, a uh, question for you. Uh, I think you mentioned in your last comments uh, the phrase civil society. Um, uh, putting the Caesar Act and US sanctions aside, um, there's been a discussion, particularly in Europe, um, about alternative policy avenues for Europe on Syria. And one of them has been the uh, proposal to engage with so-called neutral civil society or civil society organizations within regime held areas as a way of assisting Syrian people amidst the conflict without assisting or benefiting the regime. Um, just wondered if you could give your perspective on whether or not, um, whether from an American or European perspective, um, that's a feasible, uh, a feasible approach or if it's something that frankly the regime would be able to take advantage of in, in whatever circumstances. Well, I'll start with the last point. Yes, the regime can take advantage of all these circumstances and has proven it repeatedly. Look at the Constitutional Committee, which has been launched in November and which we're hoping will, um, re will be rekindled by the end of August, according to the Special Envoy. 50, um, you know, there's three committees of 50 members each from the opposition, from the regime and from civil society. A large number of the civil society members participating in the Constitutional Committee happen to be in Syria and have no choice but to travel with the regime participants on the plane. So in all fairness to them, no matter what their aspirations are, it is not guaranteed that they can have a free say in what they do. So this is something to keep in perspective. When we look at civil society outside of the regime controlled areas, which is mostly Northeast and Northwest, they have their own issues. Let's not forget there are extremist groups there, but huge numbers of small groups and small organizations have been working quietly over the years. And I'll add to that, there's now a third element, which is the civil society organizations, which have been you know, sprouting all over Europe because of the large number of refugees, refugees who, while they are making a new life in Germany, in Austria, in Britain, in France, also keep an eye on Syria because this is a place they want to go back to. When you join all these three together and you put, you know, you, you crunch the numbers, you realize that this is a huge percentage of Syrian society, of the Syrian population, who is not finding a way to make its voice heard. So yes, I do believe that there is a parallel way. I don't know if we can call it a track two or, um, or if there is a roadmap for that. But in addition to the political avenue, there is a need to involve these people and bigger organization can lead the way in that and bringing the voices and the opinions of even small things. These are people working not only on you know, the, the, the process to democracy and transition, but also on the empowerment of women, on the idea of citizenship, of separating the state from a number of other issues. So this, I think, is something that should be seriously considered, hopefully, by the governments who are involved in, in, in seeing Syria through. Great, thank you. Kateba, um, I wanted to ask you um, a broad-based question. Uh, there's been a lot more attention in the last year or so on the issue of justice and accountability, uh, particularly um, 
uh, in terms of new court cases in, in Europe. I think we saw the arrest of a man in Germany just today, uh, a former military intelligence doctor who's been accused of crimes against humanity. Um, and of course, in, in, the, in terms of the language of US policy, I just wondered from a, again, from a Syrian perspective, um, what, how important is this? Why does it come when it comes now? Is this too little too late? Is this still important? Do you see this going? Uh, towards um, the kind of long-term effects um, that much of the Syrian community wants to see? I, mean, I believe it's never too little too late. Um, when it comes to detainees, nothing is actually too late. Um, I know families who have been looking for their relatives who disappeared in the 90s or in the 80s. Some of them actually still have hope that their relatives are still held somewhere in, within the Syrian regime prisons. Um, I think in general for Syrians we've been, and we're talking again about at least 130,000 people, 130,000 families who are waiting for those who, or those relatives who disappeared. For all of these families, there's always hope. Um, and the hope is today is that at least somehow they will be able to know, um, either to know the fate of, you know, their relatives, you know, by checking the Caesar photos or by actually pushing for some, you know, some, let's say of, you know, this world justice for what they have been going through for the past 10 years. Um, a lot of times when we talk about the, the issue of detainees, we focus on what detainees go through. Um, the detention, the torture itself, in, in many cases, the killing. But we, in many cases, we also forget about the fam you know, what the families are going through, whether it's emotional or legal. A lot of families, we're talking about people who disappeared at least for 10 years. We're talking about families who don't have access to funding, who don't have access to inheritance because for some reason, even when they know actually through testimonies of other detainees that their relatives are dead, were killed under torture, the National Security Office in Syria still withholds their information, still withholds their death certificate. So this, those families are just living in limbo. And on one hand, they know through word of mouth that their relatives are probably dead, but, dead, but on the other hand, they actually have no clue whether they are officially dead or not, whether they are 100% dead or not. Um, so the hope is hopefully this would push the, the Syrian government or would put, would put pressure on the Syrian regime actually to release at least some information about what's happening. Um, I th think for a lot of Syrians, they still step skeptical about 100% justice, about um, a full accountability for the past 10 years, specifically when it comes to detainees. But at least they're still hoping that there will be some openings when, when it comes to the fate of those who are still disappeared, whether they're alive or dead. Okay, but thank you. The scale, every time you or others say it, the scale of the issue is, is hard to fathom. Um, uh, Ambassador, I have a couple questions for you. Uh, one comes from someone inside Syria um, who has challenged uh, the policy by saying, by targeting, or at least the first tranche of sanctions, by targeting the Syrian regime's elite, uh, you are, quote, pressuring people who don't care about Syrian citizens. Are you pressing the wrong button? Um, so that's one question from inside Syria. Um, and another one from uh, Basma Kudmani, uh, a senior prominent opposition figure. Um, she's asked, um, is it actually possible to measure the effect of our sanctions against the regime and differentiate that from uh, the effect of regime behavior or regime policies, whether it be damaging effects or positive effects? Uh, first of all, of course, we sanction uh, regime leaders. We wanted them to be very aware that uh, whatever their motivations for uh, participating in the mass crimes against their own population, uh, to the extent that those motivations involve being welcomed back into the international community, uh, having candlelight dinners in Paris, uh, traveling to Disney World, that's all off. And furthermore, uh, what we have seen in country after country is that as part of their motivation, it is the amassing of huge fortunes. And we are pretty suspicious that that's the case with Assad and his cronies as well. And we want them to realize that those fortunes uh, can be targeted in various ways. So uh, that is an incentive for them to uh, uh, rethink their ways. It also is uh, this um, economic corruption, 
financial side of what any totalitarian regime, but particularly the Syrian one is doing, uh, is very, very important uh, in understanding how they exercise control over the people who follow them, their followers. It's not just the top 20 or 30 families and leaders, it's the hundreds and thousands of people who emulate them, <clears throat> who bask in the sun of their largesse, who get to go in as a minor participant in one of their golf courses and this kind of thing. We want them to know that there is no financial future for them, not at least in the world that they want to plug into, which is the uh, international world, as long as they continue that. And what was the second question uh, that was a little bit different? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I have so many questions coming through, I'm losing track, to be honest. Um, I think the second question was, how would you go about differentiating the effects? Uh, oh, yeah, or how, yeah, would you, yeah, how would you measure yeah. the effects? Um, in 51 years of doing this in government or as an advisor to government, I have never seen any kind of policy, uh, however concrete that policy is, bombing Hanoi, uh, putting half a million troops into Saudi Arabia in 1990, uh, what we're doing now in Syria, which uh, can give you a scientific level answer to that question. Yes, that will lead to the following 12 actions or this approach, this campaign will produce 21% of the uh, impact that will lead to X happening. It doesn't work like that. What I ask everybody is <clears throat> look at the situation from Assad's eyes. Is Assad better off today than he was a year ago? The whole purpose of the Syrian foreign policy uh, approach that Mike Pompeo and President Trump and the rest of us are taking is to ensure that that answer is no, and that in 2021, the answer will be even further no, because that's the only way we can do one of two things. The thing we prefer, which is to have them change their policies and accept the UN led 2254 political compromise process. But failing that, what we want to ensure is that they do not benefit from their war crimes. They do not benefit from their aggression. They do not benefit from this litany of horrific things they've inflicted on the Syrian people, on the region, and on Europe since 2011. That they will be mired in this thing, and they will be uh, thinking ever more that this is not going to end well. So we have one of two alternatives. They are discouraged and are not able to exploit anything that they have achieved. Uh, that's the worst case scenario, but it's better than simply letting them uh, uh, do a victory lap. And the best case scenario, which I'm optimistic, is that sooner or later they'll realize uh, that they cannot continue and they'll actually sit down with us. Ambassador, thank you. I, I just want to follow up on, on exactly that point, actually, which was a question I was going to ask you in a bit. but. Um, I wonder if you could just expand a little bit more on what, um, in, in any way you can, um, on, on two things, the, the US government's perception or even your own personal perception of the regime's own unity um, uh, at this, I think, most challenging time um, over the, from the last nine years. And, and secondarily, um, how likely do you think it would be um, and I know there's been some back channel uh, contact with, with Russia over the last few months, and some of that has, has been stated publicly. Uh, how likely do you think it will be that the suffering that you just described in your last com comments within the regime will, will cause Moscow to have a change of heart um, and, and, and treat negotiations in a, in a more serious way? Mm, uh, let me just focus on the second one. I think that's the more important uh, uh, because it gets to this. Again, uh, the whole policy is based on uh, making the other side pay an ever growing cost for what it is doing without achieving final success. If they're willing to continue paying those costs without a final success because they hope that 
uh, despite the bipartisan nature of the Syrian policy and the vote for, for example, the Caesar Act, well, maybe in November, we'll get a new leadership, who knows? Uh, I'm not at all concerned, at least on Syria, about a change in policies uh, between administrations. I think that uh, this is a standard policy that has been broadly accepted. Uh, there may be some tweaking depending upon whether uh, who gets elected. President Trump may tweak certain things uh, in a second Trump term. We don't know that, but uh, the argument we're making in uh, all of these channels, and some of them are public. We went to uh, Sochi last May, Secretary Pompeo and a group of us. We met with uh, President Putin. We met with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. We did a press conference. We laid this all out publicly. It's not a secret. Uh, this is a policy we're pursuing. And um, we believe that uh, it offers uh, advantages vis-a-vis -vis either an all-in military opposition to the regime where we do not think we would get international and importantly American public support for anything that goes on for a long time or some kind of superficial pro forma signing up uh, to a quote political process that has no substance to it even though we have a constitutional committee even though now thanks to some Russian diplomacy we have an agenda uh, and we have a meeting uh, on the last week of August set. We still do not see uh, the regime taking that totally seriously. We note that the regime is going forward with its legislative elections, albeit postponed a bit because of COVID. And we know the regime has every intent of going forward with its presidential elections, despite the fact that 2254 is clear, a legitimate election is a UN sponsored election. And the regime has no intention of going along with that. So until we see real, seriousness, real eagerness, that's the word I would use, to engage with us on a compromise solution. Now, the other thing that characterizes our approach is we're not demanding total victory. We're not saying that Assad has to go. We're saying that uh, Assad has to change, or whoever's in charge of that government has to change its behavior. That gets to the first question. Now, also, we're not saying the Russians have to go. Even our demand that Iran leaves Syria, which is a very important demand, that's in the context of, we wanna see the military situation return to 2011, when there was only one outside force in uh, Syria, that was the Russians. And while we would prefer the Russians not to be there, it is not part of our policy to try to get them out. Uh, now, in terms of the unity of the Syrian government, that's always hard to measure. Uh, in dealing with the Syrian government, uh, not dealing with them, but following closely what the Syrian government was doing, uh, Charles, you remember in, in 2007 with the um, nuclear site on the Euphrates, the North Korean one, I was uh, impressed with how little anybody other than an uh, extremely tight circle around Assad knew about these actions. And I think that that probably characterizes a lot of what's going on. There are many war profiteers and beneficiaries of what Assad is doing, there's no doubt, and they uh, form a level or a circle of support. His inner circle is very tight. We've seen ships in it, uh, Remy Makhlouf. Uh, everybody knows with um, his brother in the 4th Armored Division uh, versus uh, units that are more associated with the Russians. There are some uh, frictions and uh, problems. Uh, but this is not something we can claim to really know in great detail, nor is it something that we are uh, hanging our policy on, this kind of regime change from within. I can't count how many times I've been through those and how many times they have failed to produce anything uh, good for the people of the country involved or good for the international community. Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, a couple of questions now for, for Reem and, and Kataba. Um, somewhat unrelated, but hopefully you can both uh, both touch on them. Um, the first one is about the Constitutional Committee, which is is mentioned in the Caesar Act. Well, is is not mentioned, but it's 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 uh, related to to the ask. How important do you think? Well, first of all, what's going on with the Constitutional Committee uh, these days? How important do you think Syrians see the Constitutional Committee um, in terms of advancing the kind of agenda we've we've talked about over the last hour? Um, and then the second question is about remittances, which has been a big sensitive issue for a lot of Syrians looking at sanctions in general, but particularly the Caesar Act. Um, uh, do you have 
concern? Do you understand the concern uh, surrounding um, the continued ability of the diaspora to, to continue to send money into, into relatives inside the country? And, and if so, what kind of uh, actions would you, uh, would you expect or demand at, at this point? Uh, and Reem, why don't, why don't you kick things off this time? Well, to begin with the remittances, uh, it is really of no import what the Caesar Act you know, uh, decides on it, because no matter how much money you try to send, and I know this for a fact in the past uh, week or so from people who are sending to their families, my own family is uh, in Damascus, uh, they take this money and give you um, the official exchange rate, which means if you send somebody in your family, let's say $200, they end up getting something like $40 in Syrian pounds. So, so it's not just the sanctions which are affecting the remittances. It's not just the banking system or, or even, you know, um, whichever way you try to send it, uh, we're not managing, Syrians are not managing to effectively help families um, left in Syria. Um, so that's, that's the issue. The Constitutional Committee, to be very blunt, I believe that most Syrians see this as uh, some crumbs that were thrown to the Syrian people who are opposed to the Assad regime. And they were told, this is the only thing that you are going to get support on. And it's not a bad thing. It does fall within the whole idea of political transition. But whereas we have accepted that the international community, the United States, the European Union, most allies in the region as well, have um, put the regime change on the back burner and the Assad has to go story on the back burner. Uh, frankly, for most Syrians, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, I believe was uh, mentioning how many people are in each area. If we're talking about a third under Assad and two thirds outside of the control of Assad, then if we just take the simple majority, which is where most elections and most changes happen, then there is a simple majority, which is against Assad staying in power and which believes that more pressure has to be imposed on the Assad regime, remembering that this regime only responds to credible threats, whether under the father or under the son. I mean, the father nearly got into a war with Turkey in 1998 because of, a of his refusal to expel Ocalan. And in 2005, only the credible threat of some kind of action after the assassination of Hariri let the Syrian troops withdraw, it led to a withdrawal from Syrian troops. So to tie all this together, I think that the Syrians, the Syrian wish to change regimes is still there. We don't talk about it anymore because in 2254, we understand that we have to go through a political transition, which begins with the Constitutional Committee. Now, to their credit, the opposition have accepted that and are working diligently at putting their beliefs, their manifestos, their goals, their missions, their values on the table. It is the regime which is finding every possible impediment to get that going, as Ambassador Jeffrey was saying, precisely to be able to have their own so-called elections. But I think it is important that we continue on a parallel track. We continue working on the Constitutional Committee, but at the same time, I think it is high time to put political pressure where it is needed, and that tends to go through Moscow. Charles, if I could just jump in. Uh, it's very important to note that when I say we're opposed, we're not uh, advocating regime change. I mean regime change by international or American action. If the Syrian people want to have regime change, and that's what we're doing in 2254, then that is their decision. Frankly, uh, if whatever their decision is leads to a regime, uh, regardless of its name or its leader, that uh, stops doing all of those things listed in the Caesar Act, listed in our policy, then we will embrace that regime or government or whatever we call it. Uh, that's the criteria. It's up to the people of Syria to decide who will lead Syria. Right now, they do not have a voice. Our political process gives them a path to that voice. Right. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you so much for, for making that clear, Ambassador. Um, Koteba? Yes, thank you. Um, I agree totally with Reem on both points, on the Constitutional Committee and the remittances. And I 
I think it's really important to be clear with the Syrian people. Like, for example, the laws itself does not kind of prevent Syrian, individu Syrian individuals to send money for their relatives. But um, private banking um, partners or um, money exchange, they take provocative actions, for example, of preventing Syrians from sending money to Syria. So there are, even though the law itself does not really have, does not affect individual Syrians, private actors actually do their own thing. And this is something actually we need to address. And we really need to be, I see a lot of the questions and a lot of people are still asking, what are the effects on ordinary Syrians? How are ordinary civ civilians are gonna be um, affected? And we really need to be, I think, frank and honest with the Syrian people. The Syrian regime is hijacking the Syrian people boss and like driving downhill. And what we are trying to do is basically either to stop that bus from going downhill or to yank the Syrian people off. Are there gonna be negative effects of any sanction programs? Of course they're gonna be, it naturally of course. The thing is sanction programs from the 80s or the 90s are so different from sanction programs today. They got much smarter, they have minimal effects usually on civilians when it comes to sanctions on individuals. The thing is, is that the Caesar Act is a powerful tool. And every now and then there are gonna be a new sanctions list. Today, so far, we know there are gonna be effects, but the right answer to tell the Syrian people is that we don't know what the effects are gonna be. And this is a point I agree with uh, Basma Qadmani mentioned. We actually don't have the measures to know what are the effects of you know, the Syrian economic policy, even though it's, it's very clear that it's driven by the Syrian, econo Syrian regime economic policy, nor are the effects of the sanctions itself. But we, what we can do is actually, and that's what I, um, what I mentioned, it's important to have a very responsive, responsive sanction programs. What we can do is actually, once we implement a sanction list, is to look at its effects on the Syrian people, Looks how, look how things have changed, and then basically fix accordingly, try to, whether it's through exemptions, whether it's to, do, to change the list itself. But we have to be honest with the Syrian people that we will not know the effects until each sanction list is implemented. But it's something, again, it's something necessary to do to stop the Syrian regime from taking the Syrian people hostage and on its way to help. Kuteba, thank you. Um, Ambassador, I've got a few questions. Um, I'll start with one, um, which has been mentioned a number of times, uh, which is relating to Lebanon. Um, does the US government expect or is it prepared uh, to deal with potential consequences uh, on the Lebanese economy, on Syrian refugees inside Lebanon. Um, I guess this goes to remittances, but then also there's a question here from Anne Barnard from the New York Times mentioning that Lebanese banks have put a blanket ban on all Syrians using foreign currency or opening up bank accounts in Lebanon. Um, is there a Lebanon angle consciously or unconsciously to, to, the, to the sanctions? And is there anything that the US government plans to do to uh, assuage these kinds of effects for the refugee populations, and obviously not just in Lebanon, but, but Lebanon is, uh, is what's been mentioned a number of times. Um, first of all, I deal with Syria, uh, not Lebanon uh, uh, or other countries, uh, apart from those countries' involvement in Syria. Refugees are one area where uh, Lebanon has been extremely generous and extremely helpful. Uh, and we work from time to time uh, with the Lebanese government on uh, actions related to uh, Syrians, including questions of when, whether they should go back and such. But we are not, uh, certainly I'm not, um, uh, participating in any efforts to uh, have any impact on the Lebanese economy, on the Lebanese banking sector. Um, and I haven't seen any indication anybody else is. I think that this is what the Lebanese banking sector has done to itself. Uh, and uh, again, the United States is, uh, um, a, uh, uh, works closely with the Lebanese government on this and a whole series of issues. In terms of the refugee population, again, uh, we continue to support humanitarian assistance to refugees both inside and outside of Syria and to the efforts by uh, uh, the relevant UN and other uh, international organizations such as IMO and such to do that. Uh, I visited some of these refugee camps. I'm convinced that all three countries, Jordan, uh, uh, Lebanon and Turkey are doing a good job. I uh, will continue to work with them on those. Of course, there is some uh, impact from the uh, 
financial collapse of the uh, Syrian pound. Uh, we are concerned about that in the northeast and indirectly even in the northwest, although Turkey, as you know, uh, has introduced the Turkish lira into Idlib uh, as a way to respond to the pr problems there. So there's a lot of uh, things that we're looking at. This is something that, as I said, it's independent from Caesar. We don't think Caesar will augment it dramatically, but it's something that we are concerned about. Uh, Ambassador, thank you. Um, one, one other question. Um... Uh, there's a bunch of questions that have come in about the central bank um, and assessments as to whether or not it's involved in money laundering. The questions have asked whether or not the US government has come to an assessment on that, whether that's still something that's um, under judgment. Uh, the US government has been tasked in the Caesar legislation to do that assessment. The assessment is not yet complete. Straightforward answer. Um, okay, then, then, to a then to a tough question. Um, what if this doesn't work? Uh, what if the regime doubles down? Uh, what if it, as I wrote recently, takes a North Korea route? Uh, it builds a wall, it isolates it from the rest of the world, its citizens continue to suffer but have no other or no better option. Is the US prepared, um, whether the administration changes in a few months time or not, is the US prepared to sustain this kind of attritional long-term policy into the long haul? Um, I wonder if maybe I can just get your personal opinion on that. Uh, my personal opinion is as follows. First of all, uh, a North Korea scenario, I think would be difficult given the relative openness of Syria and its population, first of all, to the Arab world, uh, secondly, to the international community, over the past uh, basically several centuries. Uh, secondly, uh, the one charm of North Korea is that I know of no country in our entire regional security system in Asia that wants to be like North Korea or wants to have anything like what happens in North Korea happen to it. It is a standing admonition to anybody and everybody, do not go down this route. Now the North Koreans did that to themselves. What is happening in Syria is a product, not just of the Syrian government, although Assad enthusiastically has embraced this approach. It has been facilitated by two outside powers, Iran and Russia, without whom Assad would either not be in power today or he would have had to take a very different approach to the mass opposition of his own public. Uh, they have to decide whether uh, it is going to add to their luster, add to their, uh, if in essence, this is what they're doing, uh, alternative to an American led collective security system by showing the world their product a North Korea in the middle of the Middle East. We think that that will not make them uh, particularly attractive as uh, someone as your new 911 in the Middle East. If uh, you call 911 and what you end up with is the next uh, uh, Syria as it looks today, as you put it, the North Korea of the uh, Middle East, uh, if it goes that route, uh, then we think that uh, uh, their uh, ambitious project to totally change to their favor uh, the Middle East, because this goes far beyond Syria. We haven't talked much about that, but that's the reality. They have different end goals, but they are united in opposing our current uh, system and your current system, the people of the region's current system of security uh, in the Middle East. And uh, uh, the more attractive they can make their alternative, the more likely they'll have success. It is in our interest not for them to have success. So it's in our interest to make their product, which is Assad Syria, not to be uh, particularly attractive, not a model, if you will, for other countries to wanna have uh, uh, happen to them. Ambassador, thank you so much. So I think we'll move towards closing and I'm gonna ask, the two Syrians on the panel, uh, one final question, um, or maybe a, you can take your pick between both uh, between two questions. Um, the first one is a difficult one. Where do you think we might be six to 12 months from now if, as Deputy Assistant Secretary Joel Rayburn has suggested, we're about to enter the summer of Caesar sanctions? 
Um, where do you think Syria will be six or 12 months from now? And if, uh, if that's too tough a question, um, perhaps you can suggest what's missing from US government and, and Western or international policy on Syria. What, what more can be done to further the cause that is already underway, better it, make it more efficient, uh, or even reverse it? Should I start? And, <laughs> sure, Reem, yes, please go ahead. I am quite pessimistic that we are, um, I'm, or at least I'm not as optimistic. I don't know if Ambassador Jeffrey was, was, was um, projecting some optimism that the Syrian regime does not want to end up like North Korea. It does not, but it also has a lot of tools at its hands. I think that in six to 12 months, if there is no parallel strong pressure or credible threat on the regime, we will be where we are today. The regime will never leave. It, it, it is a regime that must be made to leave, that must be removed by force. But the point I would like to make now is that we forget who are the allies of the regime, even if we left Russia aside for now. We are forgetting the, the, the potential power of the militias, which Assad has used before. We're talking about Hezbollah, we're talking about a number of Iraqi militias, of uh, Afghan militias, all around the region. And this would not be the first time that the Assad regime uses Hezbollah or other uh, small actors in the region to inflame the region around him. So when the Assad regime is cornered, they will throw firebombs and Molotov cocktails around them and see what happens. Because they always calculate that when the region is in trouble, there is no way of solving it without Syria. So you have to come back to the Syrian regime. So therefore, I believe that the regime will hold on and it will manage to secure itself. Its only weakness is securing the livelihood of its loyalists, of its shabiha, of its army, and of its own militia. If it can secure those people, it knows full well that the Syrian people, whether they starve or whether they are um, in despair, is not going to change much to the equation. This is where we bring back the region. And I am afraid that with only these sanctions, as tough as they may be, it is not enough to push them over the edge. Reem, thank you. Kataiba? Thank you. I think it's easier to answer the second question than the, the first one, honestly. For, for, uh, for the past 10 years, Syria has proved us all wrong when it comes to expectations, because it always goes in a different way. But I think what is really important to happen, specifically from policymaking perspective, whether in, Euro across, in Europe or, or in the United States, is to actually move from reactive policymaking to proactive policymaking. For the past, I remember, I mean, we also remember in 2013, chemical weapons were a red line, but then Syria was kind of pushed under the wheels because we were driven by the policy on Iran. And I feel until till today, we are still pushed. The Syria policy is still driven by whatever our policy towards Iran is. Um, we don't know what's going to happen next, I mean, in the next year in the, in the United States after elections. But what is really important for Syrians is for the world and for policymakers to look at them as Syrians, not as just a byproduct of Iran. So no matter what their policy towards Iran is, whether to keep sanctions or to lift them, whether to be friends with Iran or not, that Syria actually has its own policy, that the policy on Syria focuses on the suffering of the Syrian people, but also on the wishes and hopes of the Syrian people. And not only a group of the Syrian people, the majority of the Syrian people. I think that's what, if, if we can move from this reactive that policy that has been doing for the past 10 years to a proactive policy, I think a lot of things would be better in Syria. Kutayba, thank you so much. Um, uh, Ambassador Reem, thank you so much for, for taking the time uh, to speak with all of us and our, and our audience. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much for a huge number of questions. Uh, I did my best to, to include as many of them as possible into the discussion. Um, but this certainly won't be the last event MEI does on, on Syria. Um, I can promise you there'll be many more. So um, uh, please keep your questions and, and contacts coming. But in the meantime, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here. And uh, let's hope that uh, Syria sees some brighter days in the future. Thank you and, and goodbye. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you all. Charles, thank you all.